from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're glad to have you here at the library on a not so beautiful day, but not bad. Uh, my name is Ann Bonney. I'm with the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress. We are one of the co-sponsors, and the other is the Prints and Photographs Division. And Sarah Duke will be talking to you and introducing our wonderful speaker for the day. Uh, the Center for the Book's mission is to promote books, reading, libraries, and literature. And we do that in a number of ways. Uh, we've been doing that since 1977. The book, this Books and Beyond program is one of the ways in which we do promote reading. We have several author talks a year, mostly for people with new books, maybe that they've used the collection, or have some other connection with the Library of Congress. Uh, we also have two networks. We have a reading promotion partners network of civic educational organizations from national and we meet with them once a year it's rather loose knit so we and we do coordinate with some programs with some different times at different years we also have a network of state center affiliates and these affiliates are in all 50 states the district of columbia and the u.s virgin islands we also manage the authors program at the National Book Festival. Now, this year, the, uh, the uh, program has been set for Labor Day weekend, oh, Saturday. Uh, we got uh, removed from the mall, so we're going to be in the Washington Convention Center on Saturday, August 30th. <laughs> um, since 2009, when they created the Young Reader Center, we have been administering the, that. This is the first time children, aid, toddlers to age 16 have been invited to the Library of Congress. And we, we, it's been a big success. We're trying to get staff. We're just moving ahead slowly. Uh, we also recently acquired the library's Poetry and Literature Center so we're, we keep growing. The, la the last thing that we, um, we inherited, well, we didn't really inherit, it's a new program. It's a literacy awards program, which is sponsored, uh, well, it's not sponsored, it's supported in full by uh, David Rubenstein, who just about everybody in this town has heard of. He is, supports half the arts and <laughs> other cultural institutions. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the center, and then if you want any more information, you can look it up on the web at read.gov. Uh, that's it. And we are going to be filming this program. It will be on the web, on the center's web, and the Library of Congress web, and maybe the prints and photographs web uh, later on. But and because of this, we say if you ask a question during the Q&A, uh, you might be included in the video. So just keep that in mind. Don't say anything bad. Uh, <laughs> so I guess I would, at this point, I would like to introduce Sarah. Sarah Duke is a, the cur a curator in the Prints and Photographs Division and has been working closely with our speaker for the day. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to, to introduce um, a long a long term friend, uh, award winning cartoonist Kevin Callagher, who signs his cartoons Cal. Um, Cal has had an illustrious career for both the Baltimore Sun and the British uh, magazine The Economist. Um, and we are here today to celebrate, um, well, you're almost 36 years working for The Economist. Um, and he is, um, in this uh, publication, this beautiful publication, Daggers Drawn, um, Cal has um, highlighted um, works from just the thir first 35 years of his career. 
For those of you who may not know, Cal graduated from Harvard College with honors in visual and, and environmental studies in 1977 and spent a gap year um, touring England with, on his bicycle and playing basketball. And uh, while he was there, the economists recruited him as, uh, to be their first resident cartoonist. He spent his first decade of his career in London and in 1988 returned to the United States to take up a position at the Baltimore Sun as their principal editorial cartoonist. Um, in 2006, Cal retired from the Baltimore Sun. I, I, I just don't think of you have done in, as ever retiring. <laughs> um, although he returned to grace its pages of its um, Sunday edition in 2012. Um, with some really hard-hitting and um, intelligent um, cartoons. Um, if you've had a chance to see the, his latest cartoons on the heart and brain of the United States as it grapples with Edward Snowden, then you know that he's one of the few cartoonists today who's dealing with things other than Benghazi. Uh, since 1978, Cal has published more than 8,000 cartoons, 140 of which have been covers, mostly for The Economist. A small selection of his original art is located here in the Library of Congress in the Prints and Photographs Division. An early promoter of the use of animation in political cartoons, Kell became the artist in residence at the Imaging Research Center at the University of Mal Maryland in Baltimore County in 2006. And um, you still work there. Um, a year later, he launched an animation production, production company, Caltoons, dedicating dedicated to pro, um, producing animated political cartoons. He even toured with the famous improv comp company, Second City, in their production, The Art of Satire. And recently, he animated um, five mini lectures for The Economist on a variety of topics related to, of course, economics. Um, as one would expect from an editorial cartoonist, Cal has promoted the freedom of expression internationally. His TED Talks are available online, and as today's, and li likewise, today's presentation is being taped for future um, webcasting by the Library of Congress. Daggers Drawn is Cal's sixth compilation publication, and I now invite him to take over at the podium to show you how mighty his pen is against the world's leaders for almost 36 years. Thank you, Sarah. That was so nice. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And thank you all for coming out today. I'm really flattered that you're taking time out of your busy day to come and, come and listen. But if you don't mind, just for a moment, I'm going to visit an old friend. Okay, And it's this, the blank piece of paper. A per, per, this is a, a character who I've had a long and interesting relationship with. And so when I see something blank, in fact, when I saw that, I was very tempted to take my marker <laughs> to that really big thing there. But um, it kind of reminds me, back when I was about 13 years old, when I heard a cartoonist speak and he stood in front of a pad like this, and he would draw and talk at the same time, which I thought, wow, that was pretty interesting. Plus, as he was drawing, you saw these kind of lines appear, but you weren't exactly sure what was gonna happen next. And then you realize that he was drawing a person and not only was he drawing a person, he maybe was drawing a specific person. And you began to recognize that person pretty quickly in short order. And all of the time doing this, making it look incredibly effortless. <laughs> you thought, how, how the heck does he do it? And I was 13 years old and I thought, I want to do that. But that was a pretty crazy thing to think, actually, that you might want and maybe become a cartoonist. And I was reminded of this actually recently when I landed at Dulles Airport from a, from a trip abroad. And I was going through you know, the immigrations and customs. And I handed the normally stone-faced border guard my landing card. And he looked at it and he goes, cartoonist, we don't see many of those. <laughs> And that's the truth, is that you don't see many cartoonists. There's so few of us. In fact, in, in the world today, in the United States, we may only have about 85 
um, editorial cartoonists who are professional doing it, and around the world maybe another 85. So it's a, it's a pretty small and, and, and selective group. And uh, for me, trying to figure from where I started watching this guy as a 13-year-old to today, I've learned a lot about this craft, and I want to share some of that with you guys. And a lot of that is put into my most recent book. So what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about my time with The Economist. I thought as my book is celebrating my first 35 years with the magazine, I would share some of the insights and stories that, I've, that, that have gone along with that really interesting publication. I then take some questions, which is my favorite part uh, of a discussion, and then I'll do some drawings. I'll draw some of my uh, favorite politicians that I've done over the years. And um, we'll have basically a good time, good time from 12 to 1 in the Library of Congress. So, um, so here we are, first starting off with the, my book, uh, Daggers Drawn. And, and it was a, part of that makes this book exciting was not just the content of the book, but how it came about. A year ago today, I was planning to have a Kickstarter campaign to raise money for this book. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, Kickstarter is a micro-funding uh, website which allows um, poor artists like me to go and try to find a way to, to raise cash from, you know, basically people from around the globe who could support you. I was looking to raise $20,000 for a, 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 a book to celebrate my, my, my time with The Economist, and after 30 days, I raised $100,000, and I had pre-sold 1,800 copies to 46 different countries. So it's been a terrific year trying to get the, my books packaged, um, sent out to people around the world, touring a lot, and visiting many of the people who backed me, whether I was in uh, Singapore or, or, or um, San Francisco. I've had this, now I have a, I feel like a, a family of people uh, behind me. And it's a wonderful thing when you're a cartoonist because you spend all your time alone at a drawing table wondering how people are going to respond. And when they, when they buy a book, it's one of the great um, pats on the back in one's career. So I thought I would um, now take us back from my time with The Economist, and I thought I'd take you back to the, to the early days, some of my early work. And I think this is, a, I'm gonna start with my most important cartoon, I think. So this cartoon was a cartoon I did when I was six years old. And it's got Abraham Lincoln, probably my first ever caricature, and it's the, uh, you know, the Gettysburg Address. And, and this is a really important cartoon because this cartoon inspired a feature-length motion picture starring Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> okay. But what I, what's really cool about this cartoon is it shows where our minds are at age six because everybody here was drawing at that age. And we would take a crayon or a pencil, and we would try to capture the world in lines, including the sun, which has no lines, but collectively we know when we want to draw a sun with lines, that's kind of what it looks like. And it shows that actually all of us have a kind of a cartooning gene inside of us, but some of us, it festers and, and it dries up as you get older. But for me, I remained a six-year-old for the rest of my life. That was kind of my, my, my goal in life. So. Um, uh, when I first um, uh, went to the UK, as Sarah mentioned, I was playing basketball, but the team was having financial difficulties, so I used to go to the streets and draw caricatures and draw tourists. And it was a wonderful experience for me to learn about faces. And I've, I always had this fascination with caricature. I thought it was a, a really magical thing. And I always wanted to be a caricaturist, but there was no school for caricaturing. In fact, there's no school for being a cartoonist. You only learn by doing. And I learned by doing it on the, on the streets of London. And I saw thousands of faces go by. And when I finally got my first job, it is, my first job was with The Economist. I was 22 years old in March of 1978. I now was doing caricatures of politicians. And not holiday makers, but now policy makers. And it was a really interesting uh, advance because when you're doing caricatures of people in the streets, in my case at least, I would always try to compliment the people. Even though I'm drawing them in distortion, I would like to provide them with something that they would like. But when you're doing caricatures of politicians, well you can pretty much do with their faces whatever you like. <laughs> and um, 
And so my first decade with The Economist was basically is my role as a caricaturist and an illustrator. And during that time, I drew, of course, most major politicians around the world, um, every president, and actually also found that I was covering many historic events. But there was also something else that I learned during this time, is that when you are an American living abroad, as many of you may have done at some point, you are held personally responsible for everything that goes on in this country, right? <laughs> so as a result, I began really interested in trying to learn more about politics and about current events and what was going on, and I had this new passion. And so I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could mix my passion with current events and caricature and become a political cartoonist? So as I say, when I first started with The Economist, I was doing mostly caricatures. <laughs> and I was doing you know, both the right and the left, and, and I was learning a lot about faces. And, um, and so some characters, of course, <laughs> offered more, more material than, than others did. So um, <clears throat> I was now, um, I, I learned a, one of my great, greatest uh, quotes about caricature that will reside with me forever was done by Annabel Caracci, who was an Italian Renaissance painter, who said once that a good caricature is more true to life than reality itself. And so if you can get beyond just the, the, the superficial glibness and, 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 and absurdity of caricature, but capture the spirit and character of someone, then you realize that caricature can be quite a powerful weapon, not just a source of fun and games. And so I was learning that the line, the, the, the drawn line, uh, and, and the people you draw would start paying attention to your cartoons. And my cartoons are being read in boardrooms and in, in capitals um, all around the planet. And I also to learn something about caricature is how watching a politician age while they're in office. So you all know, of course, being a president usually means that your faces age exponentially, a lot faster than everybody else. And we've seen this, I think, with Barack Obama. Here's an example. This is what he looked like in 2008 when he was running for office. You guys remember this? Okay. Big, toothy, bright smile, upward looking. He looked um, hopeful, optimistic, right? Now, Fast forward to today, this is what he looks like today, okay? So it's a kind of different feel. But it means that the face can tell a story, okay? Caricature and face, because we as humans, are, we're, we're constantly engaged in the notion of looking at faces. And it's not just the president. Actually, it happens the same thing in Great Britain. This is David Cameron. He's the prime minister of Great Britain, who came in useful looking like, like Barack Obama, but immediately had to face a, a, a tough economy and had to institute mountains of cuts around the country. And in, I tell you what, it was amazing to see the change in his face. This is what he looked like. And then three months later in office, this is what he looked like. <laughs> So it is amazing what can happen to people's faces over time. So now I decided I was going to venture into the realm of being a political cartoonist, and The Economist um, offered me that position in 1999 after I had been working with them for nearly 20 years. Now, The Economist, for those of you familiar, is an is a utterly unique uh, um, publication, and one of its distinct characteristics is that nothing in the magazine is signed. There's no attribution. There's no masthead saying who the editor is or whatever. It's completely anonymous. So the notion that they would then allow a cartoonist to have a cartoon depicting his or her point of view, even though it doesn't have a signature, just by its existence is a signature of its own. And it took me 20 years to build up the trust of, the, of the, um, the, uh, the staff and the editors there before they allowed me to go down that path. And it's been something that I, I've enjoyed ever since. In fact, I've enjoyed it so much. And be because I waited 20 years for that opportunity, I have not missed a week since it started in 1999. Wherever I'm on vacation, anywhere in the world, I would stop everything and do my cartoon for The Economist because the last thing I want is anybody else to do that um, while I'm on vacation. So I've taken, I really value this opportunity for this really incredibly unique audience. And I've, I, the cartoons that I do, of course, I do do many international cartoons, but doing cartoons on American politics actually looms fairly large 
not just because the, half the Economist audience is based here in the United States, but it's also because the world actually pays close attention to what's going on in the United States. Even something like this, the Tea Party's activities and the, the government shutdowns are something that um, the world was watching mostly with despair, but they were all watching extremely closely. And the most recent incidents of uh, NSA spying, um, at first, of course, everyone thought it was a problem for us, but when Angela Merkel's telephone and other world's leaders' phones were being hacked as well, it became suddenly an international story. So we also have um, other stories. Um, this is actually a very timely one. This is a multi-panel cartoon. You can see Obama there saying, after years of hardline dogma, a new regime with a moderate tone has raised hope around the world. But the jury is out whether the current government will live up to its great promise. But enough about me. <laughs> so the idea that one of the things about being a cartoonist for The Economist is that it is a weekly publication, which means unlike my, my cartoons I do for The Baltimore Sun, I can draw something today for The Sun, and it will appear tomorrow, and the news, I pretty much have some idea what will happen in that 24-hour span. For The Economist, however, I might do a cartoon on Wednesday that will need to also be read a week from Wednesday. So you need to do cartoons that are both kind of timely and on edge as best as you can, but also that will not be caught out by events. So you'll find that many of the cartoons I do for The Economist might be more generic in their focus rather than, than on a specific event. Now here's a cartoon I wanted to share with you. This is actually my most famous cartoon that I have ever done. That first actually appeared in the Baltimore Sun, but then later The Economist reproduced it on its cover. It's about the stock market. And as you can see there, it says, just a normal day at the nation's most important financial institution. A guy on the phone there says, I've got a stock here that could really excel. They overhear him. Excel? Really excel? Excel, sell, 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 sell. It carries on at the bottom. Sell, sell, sell. This is madness. I can't take any more. Goodbye. Goodbye, goodbye. Bye, 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 bye. <laughs> and a guy at the bottom there saying, I've got a stock here that could really excel. <clears throat> So here's the curious thing about this cartoon. Appears first in Baltimore Sun, 1989. Within days, it's in the Her Inter International Herald Tribune. It's appearing in, in Australia, South America, all across Europe. And then the next thing you know, the phone starts to ring. And it's stockbrokers from around the world. And they all ask two things. First, they said they want a copy of the cartoon. And then second, they say, this is exactly how it is, OK? <laughs> So ever since, though, I get requests almost at least a month, every once a month, but often weekly, from people who want to use this cartoon. I had a request last week from someone in India who wants a six-foot wide version of it to hang in their office. But that was trumped by a request that I got three months ago in, in Hong Kong. They wanted twice that size to hang in their office. So it's amazing how certain cartoons can, can resonate in people's minds. So as, I, as um, Sarah mentioned, I've done over 140 covers for the, for the magazine over the years, covering a whole range of subjects. Um, this cartoon I created actually um, after Gabrielle Gifford was shot, and it was a cartoon that I was actually at a podium like this with the editor of The Economist, and we were talking about um, the events of the week. And someone said, they suggested, well, if you were going to do a cover this week, what would you do? And I did a real quick sketch just like you see here, and the editor saw that and said, let's do that on the cover this week. And I went into, the, into my hotel room and did the cut cartoon on the, on the cover right there. Well, this brings me actually to a couple of stories I want to share with you about um, The Economist uh, and doing covers for them. Um, one story takes place before the internet, and another story takes place um, after the internet. So this one is actually the after the internet one. It should be the other way around, but this, this still, still works. So, so the story is this. It's 19, actually this is about, uh, about only about seven years ago, I think. And, and um, um, me and the family are on vacation in the Bighorn Mountains of Wyoming. And I made the mistake of checking my email. Okay? And there is a note from The Economist saying, Dear Cal, um, you sent us this rough sketch a few weeks ago about um, the Uncle Sam and the, and, and the Chinese dragon drinking oil. We want to put it on the cover this week. Can you please paint it and send it along? And um, so I write back to them. I said, guys, I, pro I, I look, 
there's three problems here. Okay, the first is I'm on vacation. The second is I don't have any paints. And the third is I am in the middle of nowhere. And I figured that would be enough. And they wrote back to me and said, well, see what you can do and, and get back to us in the morning. So anyways, I'm, I'm, at, a, I'm at a dude ranch. And, I, and I, so I go find the dudes. <laughs> and I say, dudes, uh, you know, where can I get some paints around here? So they sent me down a dirt road about 10 miles to this town. And they mentioned that there was a pharmacy in the back of the pharmacy that lady likes to paint once you go find her. So anyways, eventually we come back with a little kid's pack, six color paints, you know, a little thing, you know, like, and, and a, one piece of watercolor paper. And then I create this, this cartoon. Now notice the primary colors here, okay, pretty straightforward. I then take my, my laptop, I have a portable scanner, I scan it in pieces on the laptop. I then email it via dial-up to London, which might <laughs> took three hours or something. But the thing was, the cover ended up looking like this, and a few days later, it appeared in every country around the world, just from the, from the, ta from the kitchen table at the dude ranch to, uh, to people's dinner table around the world. It's pretty amazing. Now, his second story is actually to, to bring us back to the time before the Internet, where, of course, I spent a lot of my time with The Economist. And this cartoon took place when Mikhail Gorbachev first came onto the scene, and I think it was 1986 in the Soviet Union. Now, Dial your minds back to that era. You remember what the previous um, Soviet leaders looked like. They all looked like, you know, they, they were uh, completely inscrutable characters and, and something out of a bad James Bond movie. And, and we have um, Mikhail Gorbachev come forward, and he's really amazing because he's dynamic. He actually smiles. And um, so they, the economists asked me that they, they were going to do a profile him for, of him for the cover and asked me for some ideas. And I said, well, you know, there's this brand new TV show called Miami Vice. And wouldn't it be interesting if I drew him like a character out of Miami Vice? And they said, great, go, go, let's go do it. So this is on a Tuesday. Wednesday is when the cartoon needs to be in London ready to go, our press day. So I arrive home Tuesday. And I realize I don't have any photographs of Miami Vice. And in those days, before the internet, if you didn't have any photographs, you didn't have any photographs. I mean, there's no way to do it unless it was going to be on TV that night. I was in trouble. But then I turned to my wife, and she had a great idea, which was we should go shopping. Okay? So what we did is we went down to Brighton. I was living in England at the time. We went down to the shops in Brighton, and I, we bought our very best... Miami Vice outfit, clothed myself. We used a Polaroid. This is the old Polaroid shots, you know, click, zzz, click. That was what we did. And so that's me modeling in the back of our house for the Mikhail Gorbachev thing, okay? So this is the most expensive cartoon I've ever had to do. I even had to buy that car. That was the really crazy thing, okay? So anyway, so that's how, how that, that one came about. That's what was life was like before, before the internet. All right, so people often ask me, so where do you get your ideas from? How, how do you do it? How, how does it happen? So, so one of the things that it's important for people to know is that uh, when you're a cartoonist, you wear many hats, political cartoonists and specifically, is that you are, first, you're a journalist, okay, where you have to keep up with what's going on in the world as best you can. The second hat you wear is that of a, of a commentator. We are a columnist, I'd like to suggest, where you're having to make a commentary on what's, what you're seeing is important to discuss today. The third hat you wear is that of a satirist, where the commentary that you're delivering is always going to be done using humor. And then the fourth, fourth, last hat is that of an artist. Okay, So you're doing all of these various different things on a deadline. And this is the thing is that you have to be hyper efficient with your time. So in this case, I always start my day trying to keep up with what's going on with the world, listening to the radio, reading as much as I can, talking to well-informed people. But it's a nonstop thing. Every night before I go to bed, I'm constantly scanning the news. You're just all the time drinking in, absorbing information. And now the next step gets a little trickier is you know, what you do with this information. Well, you, you tend to try to focus on what, you know, what you're going to be. Um, uh, you think about your audience, first of all, what they may want to hear, what they're listening to, what would be interesting. 
And uh, you come up with a subject first, and then you try to find an angle on that subject. And usually when I'm doing this, I have a piece of paper in front of me because I, I like to sketch while I'm thinking because I've found over time it's a curious relationship between the left and right part of your brain, which your ideas are always firing back and forth between. Is that when you draw something, there may be an idea that logically was going to make a lot of sense, but that when you start to draw it, it's not working. Then other ideas that are kind of mishy-mashy in your head, but when you start to draw them, they come alive and they start to have substance. And so I like to have um, some, a piece of paper there. And uh, what I have here now is I'm going to show you an example of a cartoon that I did about a year, year and a half ago for The Economist, a cover for the magazine. I want to show you how it started and then how it ended and the process, okay? So the first sketch, and this is really clear, you'll get an idea. The first sketch looked like this, okay? <laughs> And so the subject was this. The Economist was going to do a leader, their, their cover story about taxing the rich. And in their perspective, they thought, well, you know, considering the economic situation both here in the United States and in the UK, that there could be some room for some tax increases temporarily on, on the more well-off. So I decided I was going to pursue this. I was thinking around ideas, and I came up with an idea of a fox hunt. Because fox hunting is kind of something you might expect to see, you know, people who have money do. But I was going to change it. I was going to do a twist. Instead of doing um, if people chasing foxes, I was going to have government people chasing rich people. All right. So this was, so this was the first sketch. But the next sketch is much clearer. So you, you'll be able to really see it. Okay. Where, where is going on here? So anyways, the sketches, I'm working out composition and design. I'm trying to, to play around with them. And, um, and in London, they're doing some other things. So this was my next sketch. And my third sketch is now you're, you're beginning to see the pieces come together a little bit better now. Okay, You can see the, the, the bodies and so on. Um, the, the fourth sketch, see, it just, it just every time I work it, every iteration, it improves. Now in London, at the same time, they're taking some of my sketches and playing around with what, some, what captions they might do for it. And they're, they're goofing, playing around basically as much as I'm playing around on this end. So once I've established the pencil sketch the way I like it, then I start working on the caricatures and start working on the painting, putting the people in the various different positions. And the finished painting would look something like this, where all the characters in play and you can see the money flying around there and so on. And when it appeared on the cover, it looked like this. And all of this, going from that first initial sketch you saw to this, took 36 hours. And that's how tight the deadline is. We get the, we get the, um, the order to go, and I even get some sleep in there somehow. But you're basically, you know, uh, metal, metal to the pedal, pedal to the metal, pedal to the metal, that's it. And you're working really hard, really fast. Now, a couple of other projects I've done for The Economist over the years, I actually created a board game for them. Uh, this is actually in the last chapter of the book we talk about some of the fun um, projects I've done with The Economist over the years. And this was a great one. When the, um, the credit crunch uh, broke in like 2008, The, um, the Economist, we, we, we thought that uh, in the game Monopoly was uh, created during the Great Depression. We said, well, well, maybe we should do some cartoon um, explanation of the lunacy of the credit system in a board game. And so I created this game. And actually, you can still get it online. It's a free online game, economist.com backslash board game. And um, with everything, we actually created a currency. Um, that's Walter Baggett is the, the founder of The Economist way back in the day and the back of Bank of Econia there. Um, and we had different things. For example, we had a chapter 11. It was a little bit like playing, you know, going to go to jail type thing. And, um, and so the game, the idea of the game is that first half of the game, you're earning money like crazy. And the first half is you're going on the board. But then the second half, you're losing money like crazy. You learn, you earn so much money in the first half. The best thing you can do is have your name, your, your town is named after you. You become so rich. But then on the way down, things go so bad that in fact, this guy here has just bought e Iceland on eBay. Because things just go out of out of control on the way back, so it's a it's a great game, and it was a it was a fun project to do for them. But I also did a, a series of animations, and I, I uh, as, as Sarah um, mentioned in the introduction, I've I've really been a, a great advocate in, uh, of animation and the power and possibility of animation, starting back from when I did my senior thesis at Harvard, which was a 13 minute long animated cartoon based on a, a comic strip that I had in the Harvard Crimson. And so I have always been, you know, thinking about what we could do with, with, with um, political cartooning and animation. And now that we have computers, 
I think that there's more possibilities coming on board. So I started with my passion for politics, my passion for caricature, now animation. And in 2008, I did a very interesting project that culminated with a national tour with Second City, the improv comedy troupe. So what I did is I built a, a series of 3D animated um, uh, uh, characters, you know, Hillary Clinton and, and John McCain. And we did a, uh, a tour where um, during our, uh, our show, which would often have a thousand people in the audience, a member of the Second City um, group would be on stage and announce to the audience that we had a very special visitor and that George Bush or Barack Obama or John McCain was here to address the audience. And then on screen, the character would appear like this, but I would be backstage in a motion capture suit. Okay, one of these kind of long leotard things with all these digital markers on them, so that whenever I would move, the character would move. And then I would have voice recognition software, so whenever I talked, the character would talk. And so we would have a live press conference with the audience, where the audience would ask the character questions and then he would answer back. And we uh, culminated actually with a debate between these two guys, and which took place in New York City uh, in, in, in Times Square uh, just before the uh, election that year. And uh, my favorite bit was a, a you know, question and answer with John McCain. And now that he's here, I hope you guys might as don't mind, I'm going to ask him a question. Senator, you had Sarah Palin as your VP candidate. Do you think she was qualified to be president? Listen, my friends, Sarah Palin is qualified to be president. She has ridden caribou to hunt polar bears with bazookas. She has caught Chinook salmon blindfolded with her teeth. No community organizer in Chicago has ever done that, right? That's right. Thank you very much. Let's give it up for Senator McCain. Come on, give it up. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for coming here today, Senator. All right, so in addition to doing these 3D animation, I've done a series of, of 2D stuff as well, and, and here's one I did about economics, about bubbles. When the price of an asset rises faster than can be explained by economic fundamentals, it creates a bubble. Famous bubbles include tulip mania in Holland during the 17th century when the prices of tulips reached unheard of levels and the South Sea bubble in Britain a century later. Here, speculators, which included a vast array of citizens, including parliamentarians and a king's mistress, drove up the share price of the South Sea Trading Company with disastrous results. There have been many others since, including the dot-com bubble in internet company shares that burst in 2000, and the bubble in house prices, which when it burst in 2007, helped to trigger the recent global economic downturn. Economists argue whether bubbles are caused by the irrational behavior of crowds, aided in part by savvy speculators, or are the result of misinformed consumers who assume the inflated prices are sensible. Whatever their cause, bubbles do not last forever and often end not with a pop, but with a crash. Here we go. All right. So that is um, that it gives you just a brief introduction to the crazy world of Cal and doing cartoons for The Economist. And I'm hoping to have, of course, another 35 years to, to look forward to. But I'm also very much looking forward to your questions right now. So thank you very much. Thanks. So, um, yeah, so um, I'm going to open the floor for questions. I will repeat your question uh, so that it will be picked up by the, the, the microphone here. So does anybody um, have any questions? Yes. Um, I, I, I love The Economist. I um, spent some time in the early 90s in Poland. Um, and every week I would go to the hotel and make sure I had my co got my copy. Um, do you ever find yourself needing to hold back, being like less vicious than you would really like to be? Oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. So the, the question was, knowing, uh, you know, knowing the economists like you do, uh, is whether someone like myself would be holding back, being less vicious in a cartoon. Uh, because of its of its venue and because perhaps of their of their perspective on certain things. Well, uh, 
you know, I have been with the economist such a long time, it's a little bit like being married for 35 years. <laughs> in that I know them and they know me. I know what they're, what they're willing to accept, what works. Um, I know how they think. And, um, and so that considering that venue, uh, you, you know, you, you work within those kind of parameters. However, one of the great things I remember someone telling me about creativity. Cre creativity works with borders, with restrictions. That's when you have to be creative, is how do you maximize the, the limited circumstances that you have. That gets the brain really going. And so what happens is that within those confines, you can still do an awful lot. And plus, the, the venue and the audience that you have is really is, is extraordinary. So you have the opportunity to still kind of uh, visit subjects, but you just have to do it in, either in a tone of voice or in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a type, in a perspective that is going to be engaging to that audience and that they, that they can uh, accept. And this is some, a lesson that actually I've learned an awful lot in being in the world of political cartoons. I've worked with very different audiences. The Baltimore Sun is a local audience of an American city that has you know, sometimes very parochial perspectives. Uh, the Economist is a very global, but it's a very elite audience, very different audiences. And so you can, you, you can have the choice when you're in my position. You can either talk at that audience or you can talk with that audience. And so if you want to be, if you think that you're in this business to, um, uh, I guess, change people's mind, maybe that's too strong, you want to uh, elevate the conversation, it's really important that you be able to engage people as best as possible. That to me is an effective cartoon that engages people. And I think that we all do this. When we're, when, with our, when we're with our grandparents, we might speak in a different tone of voice than we might on the same subject when, than we are with the, the guys in the locker room. So we all do this, and I think you can successfully do that as a cartoonist and still be very effective. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, you've done a cartoon called Hunting the Rich. Have you ever done a cartoon called Hunting the Poor? Hunting the poor. <laughs> so the question was, I've done a cartoon hunting the rich. Have I done a cartoon hunting the poor? I, have, I don't recall doing a specific cartoon like that. Um, but I think it, one of the interesting things that I found, do, you know, doing 8,000 cartoons, published cartoons, as, and also publishing six books with many different presidents, most likely, is that when you see my cartoons that appear during, let's say, a Bill Clinton administration, those people who read that book will think, this guy does nothing but bash Democrats. This guy is, you know, he's bad news. Then you do a cart you see a book that I did after, and say George H.W. Bush or George W. Bush and say, this guy does nothing but bash Republicans. And the thing is, is that when you're in my, in my business, even those people who you vote for inevitably let you down or don't live up to your standards. And they give you plenty of material for you to chide them on. And so, uh, you know, I also feel that um, I, I'm not an ideologue in, my, in my, my work. I certainly have my own, own perspective, and I don't necessarily treat every politician or every side equally. But at the same time, one lesson that I learned when living in the UK, where I was an outsider looking at the lunacy of their politics, and I could look at the Labor Party and I say, you guys are acting like a bunch of idiots. And then the conservatives say, I can't believe what you're doing. But I was, an, I was allowed to criticize both of them without betraying my tribe because I wasn't from there. And that w gave me an enormous amount of freedom, and it, particularly as a commentator. When I came back to the US um, after 12 years of living abroad, I found I had this, this similar sort of situation. I had been away enough that I maybe had sort of clipped that umbilical cord. And I was able to come back and be able to look and say, boy, you Democrats can do some pretty stupid things, and you Republicans can do some pretty stupid things. And believe me, most people recognize that. But it, it, was a, a, it kind of freed me up in a way uh, in, in my uh, art as a, as a critic. And so it, that's something I may not have done, done cartoon literally, as you suggest, but I think I've done lots of cartoons on, you know, around the, in, 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 the, in the range of the subject matter. Oh, yes, yes, ma'am. Do you have very many sketches that you <coughs> <clears throat> so do I have many uh, sketches that do not get published? Well, the, uh, you know, the way that the, um, the normal process for a cartoonist, and, and, and mine may be a little bit different than, than most, is that you, know, you do your pencil sketch, and you don't get to applying the ink uh, until it's been okayed by the editor. In my case, it's important because the inking process can take three hours. I use 
a hundred year old pen nibs, dip it in a bottle of ink, scratch, 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 bop, you know, scratch, 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 scratch. Very, you know, um, methodical and medicinal, maybe even for me, but it uh, takes an awful long time. You don't want to go down that path until you have it locked in. And um, probably 95% of the time when I present the one sketch that I present to The Economist every week, they don't even know what I'm going to be doing. I say, you know, they don't say, Cal, what are you drawing this week? Sometimes other publications want to know what their cartoonists are doing or even suggest their cartoonists give them two or three sketches. I go to The Economist, one sketch, this is what I'm thinking of doing this week. And 95% of the time, we don't have any issues. The other 5%, they may say, well, <clears throat> either A, I don't get it, or B, we're, we've got five articles on that same subject this week. Maybe let's try something different. Or there's usually some way around. It's less that, you know, we, <coughs> we're in hot, tut tut tut. We're not going to run that type of thing. I did have one cartoon that the Baltimore Sun didn't run, which I'm going to do a quick sketch of right now because um, I think you'll get it. Um, and you can understand. That's for you. You can have that one. <laughs> so, so it was the, the election day. 1992, I guess, 1992, Election Day. And so remember, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton were running against each other. And so I did a cartoon of Uncle Sam as a baby here. Okay. And uh, he had his diaper. In other words, they say a nappy in, uh, in the UK, okay, here. So you're seeing a kind of a, a, a back view of him here like this. And his, he has, this hand is down like this, and this hand is coming around holding his nose as he's, and, the, and I think they had the, the bush quail on the, um, on the diaper, and the caption was, time for a change. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, all right, so uh, it was a strong cartoon. I get it. I completely get it, okay? I completely get it. But my editor, so my editor said, ah, pff, come on, you know. And he said also, he said, look, this is a day when you should just be encouraging people to get out to vote. You know, you've had a whole year to say whatever you want to say. And, and sure enough, so we swapped the cartoon out. Um, but I know other cartoonists, you know, I, I, I have been very privileged in my life to work with great editors, great publications, that have given me enormous amount of freedom. But with all freedom comes responsibility. And so with that, it's imperative to me that I do cartoons that are you know, journalistically sound, that I should be able to support you know, uh, with a reasoned argument. Uh, cartoons that um, are not racist, they're not sexist. Cartoons that are furthering the conversation, hopefully in some sort of way. And so, um, and so I really value that. And so I don't try to present cartoons. I, there's plenty of cartoons that go on in my head. I say, no way, they're gonna, not going to run that, not going to run. But then, you know, like we said, I work within borders. I can do something maybe even better within those restrictions. Yes? Um, very interesting lecture. And I'm wondering, you talked about just now um, a cartoon that wasn't published. Are you talking with archivists on how you're preserving your, your collection and what you're going to do? I've had some very preliminary conversations with some people. Does anybody here want to talk afterwards? I'm available. <laughs> I'm in the right place here. But we should definitely uh, talk about because there is some, you know, obviously I, I, I keep my, I now keep my rough sketches because I think that they're valuable. I also know that when I look at other artists, I like to see their rough sketches. I think that tells a lot about how their brain is working. And, uh, and also because, you know, uh, I like to do things still the old-fashioned way. So I'm using, you know, old materials and so on. Another question. Yes, Mike. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the spot illustrations you do for The Economist? <clears throat> yeah, so the question was about the spot illustrations I do for The Economist. So The Economist has a column, a weekly column called Lexington, which is focused on American affairs. If anybody, if you have not read it, I, I had one person tell me um, that if you're going to read three things in The Economist every week, you read the lead editorial, you read Lexington, and you look at Cal's cartoon. So I think that's pretty good. But Lexington is fantastic. It's a columnist. And so I work, they, they, the columnist sends me the column, and then I, um, you know, uh, 
quickly come up with ideas. Now, he's filing late. Remember, Wednesday is our deadline. So he files late on Wednesday. I normally don't even start that drawing till about like 11 o'clock at night or something. It's quite you know late when I get going on it. So I'm working on it till the wee hours. I normally finish my economist at about 3 or 4 in the morning on a Thursday. Every, every Thursday. That's been my weekly schedule for 35 years. Yes, sir? It seems like the great thing about cartoons is they simplify things and communicate effectively. Seems like the bad thing is that they simplify. Yeah. And um, yes. have you uh, any examples of where you maybe oversimplified a complicated thing and had regrets, or, or maybe bigger ones you prefer not to have regrets? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's a great question. So the question was about how cartoons, one of their, their greatest characteristics is that they over, no, they, they simplify, distill down to, you know, black and white. The, the, the essence of a story, but then that also can betray one of the their, their biggest um, uh, problems because they can be, as a result, almost innately, they're unfair because they, they, they just are peeling away at things. So um, I, I found that to be, um, it was one of the challenges of, of, of the job that there's sometimes very, very complicated situations that are really hard to do over just two or three panels. And so increasingly, I've been doing longer form cartoons that allow you, like a graphic novel, to tell the story and allow to pull on the different parts. It's also something that has happened to me as I've become more wise, I guess, or accumulate much more knowledge over time, is that you suddenly see the world as gray. I see the world less as black and white now than ever, seeing it's more as gray in all these different moving parts. And you want to give honor to all these different perspectives if you can. So, um, you know, I can't think of a specific cartoon, but I do know there has been times where I felt, you know, maybe that was, to use a great English expression, over-egging the pudding. You know, the cartoon by being too simple, you know, you can be too hard on somebody. The caricatures, I think, particularly, because a caricature can, can give a, across um, signals about someone and that you can't be written down in world, words. And it's not just that you might make somebody look un, you know, un, unflattering, but just by the way they carry themselves. You can, I think there's a borderline between making somebody look unpleasant and making somebody look evil. Now, if you want to make, let's say, you know, some characters in the world deserve to be evil, but I think that, say, turning a president into someone who is evil, to me, is not a good thing. I don't think that that's fair. People are trying to do their job. You may disagree with them. And you can do some pretty strong caricatures. But if you get too simple, you, you have this danger of, of maybe, again, over-egging the pudding. I wish I had something more specific for you. I'll have to think about that one. Yeah, Len. Um, two quickies. One, um, like some surgeons and violinists who play ball, were you ever concerned about I uh, injury to your right hand? <laughs> because you played basketball for a while, well right. into your establishment. Second one is, do you have uh, a, a foreign uh, cartoonist that we should think about looking at, and do you have anyone uh, that's emerging, a young person that you are especially high? Mm -hmm. All right, so the first qu question was about, uh, I played basketball uh, right up till you know, just a few years ago, and the question was, do I ever worry about, that, about breaking my hand well or hurting yourself that it could affect your, your, your business? Well, that, obviously, that's always a, you know, it's always a possibility, and fortunately, it never, it never quite happened. Um, but as far as the cartoonists, this is a great question because there are some really amazing cartoonists going on out there. I'm just going to give you a couple of names that are, 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 are worth uh, paying attention to. One of his name is a uh, South African cartoonist, Jonathan Zapiro, with a Z, Z-A-P-I-R-O. So Jonathan Zapiro was, is a white South African, but was uh, you know, um, a great anti-apartheid activist uh, back in the day, spent time in jail and that whole thing. And so when, when the new um, uh, uh, black government came forward and Nelson Mandela was president, he had known Nelson Mandela. He was now in the business as a cartoonist of being a critic. And he had to be a critic. That was part of his job. But he was taking on you know, his, his great, um, you know, the great figure of Nelson Mandela. And um, he also was basically on the front line of freedom of expression in a developing country that was trying to figure out how to manage that. And um, Jonathan had, it subsequently has been sued by various members of government and has you know, um, had his life threatened because of it. But the best story, I think, comes from his uh, story he tells about Mandela, who called him up one day and said you know, what a great job he was doing with his cartoons. And Jonathan said, but you know, many of these cartoons are critical of you. And he said, that's your job, and so you should be. And that gives another kind of a salute to the, you know, the maturity of, of Nelson Mandela and, and, you know, and what a loss he is. 
for not having more of those type of people in charge. Um, there's also a very interesting cartoonist uh, based in Swiss, there's a Swiss cartoonist based in France named Patrick Chapat, C-H-A-P-P-A-T-T-E. And Patrick is interesting because he uh, speaks three languages, French, German, and English. He does cartoons in French, German, and English. And each of them have a different personality according to the culture and the audience that he does. And that just is, is, is a real um, mastery of, of what's going on. And um, the final cartoonist I'm going to mention to you, and I'm going his name is escaping me right now, but it will come before I'm through, is an is a, a Australian cartoonist who, to me, is one of the best cartoonists practicing in the world today because he does every one of his cartoons is a full watercolor painting. It's a magnificent piece. But his cartoons are almost entirely done on, on Australian politics, so they, they don't really travel very well. But he's, you know, he's, just a, he, he's setting a completely different new kind of style. Uh, in the world of cartooning. Another question, how are, we doing, how are we doing for time? We have a few more minutes, yeah, and then I'll do some drawing. Yes, sir. Um, uh, you, you mentioned some of the sources uh, for your ideas. You absorb uh, contemporary media as much as you can. Uh, but yet, you, even, though, even though your cartoons are timely, and, and they have to be, they, they seem to have timeless topics like greed and uh, political corruption, frustrated searching for peace and so on. Are there any past cartoonists whom you draw from some of these timeless ideas and so on? Are, uh, do you see yourself as part of a tradition, historical tradition of cartooning? Well, it's a great, you know, the question was about whether, you know, looking back at my, the subjects, I tend to do, do grander themes, and uh, is this part of some tradition, you know, or do I see myself following the tradition of cartoonists? Well, I, you know, I have to say that has dawned upon me more recently about those brothers and sisters in the craft who, who practiced before me, who, when I was young and starting off, would look up to them and see them as something to aspire to. But now I see them as peers and uh, understand the, the challenges that they had to try to produce what they did and respect them for so many different, diff different reasons. And um, I think that increasingly, Partly because I, I think we look at the, at the um, landscape, the digital landscape, and the way cartoons are consumed today. Okay, we're competing with what? We're competing in our newspapers with our own weather map, for example, just on for visual stimuli. We're competing on the internet and with all these other uh, um, uh, film and television uh, ways for people to consume so much information. And we are this static image. So what I have to do if I want to be successful, if I want to grab your eyeballs and hold you for 10, 15 seconds, then I have to maximize the, the potential that that box offers. And I think that one of the great ways to do it is to try to get, get down and capture these big stories and big subjects that we are all grappling with, that kind of you know, unifies us all if you, can, if you can do those. Now, you can't do those every single day in your cartoon. But there is times that that, that 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 is what you're aspiring to do. It's a little bit like being a baseball player. Now, I love using vis visual metaphors. That's my, my world. So hang with me here for a second. And you're a baseball player. You want to hit a home run every time you come up. But you can't every time. Because it all depends on where the ball is coming in and, and the speed and, and uh, whether that pitcher is lefty and you, you're lefty or you're righty, whatever. In other words, the circumstances have to be just right for a home run. And so the same with the cartoons, is that every day when you set out to do a subject with a cartoon, you can't always do the way that you want to do because it's depending on what all the news and everything that's happening at the time. But I think that the, the short answer to what you say is that I do feel that I'm part of a tradition. I feel that I'm trying to um, uh, best exercise and elevate the craft as best I can with the, with the tools and knowledge that I've accumulated over my, my 35 years. One more question, then I'll do some drawing. Yes, Sandy. What are you focusing on with your animation right now? What am I focusing on in my animation right now? My, I, I have two thoughts, and this is a, a, part of this is a, a, an aspiration rather than something I can point to a um, specific thing that's going to be happening this month. But I, am, um, uh, I believe now that with the uh, digital landscape changing the way that we're consuming information to moving away from television shows to the Hulus, the Netflix, to that kind of um, uh, audience where now we can go possibly for shorter form, um, two to five minute pieces that could be then uh, sold as uh, packages over time, that um, that would be the, the logical place for 
a good quality political animation to, to take place. So I am going to be trying to, like the 3D stuff that you saw, saw there with the uh, Barack Obama and, uh, and, the, and the John McCain, is looking for venues for possible short form animated political cartoons on, on, a, on a good platform. The Economist has been exploring it with me in some capacity. All right? John Stewart. John Stewart. John Stewart would be an interesting place. Be an interesting place. So let me do some quick sketches for you here, okay? And I, then I know you guys got to go. All right. Let's see if we can get some quick ones here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Everybody can hear me good from here, away from the microphone. All right. So I'm going to do just maybe four or five. I'm going to start with Al Gore, who I love to draw because he's got an interesting shape to his head. All right? Because the shape of the head is really an important part of your why people recognize you. Okay? So this is going to be a front-on caricature. Now these guys I'm drawing you right now, I've drawn these people so many times that I can draw very quickly. But if I was to draw Al Gore for a cartoon for the comics this week, I would have photographs, scores of photographs on my computer in front of me, even though I know his face pretty well, just to get the more subtleties and try to capture those nuances. But I can get the, the basic structure of him because I've drawn him so many times, I think. So he, uh, he's a funny one because Al Gore actually likes cartoons. He, um, he has a collection of cartoons, a few, a few of mine. And even with just a few lines here, you can start to see him appear in front of you, right? So he, he's getting the kind of look here. But one of the funny things about Al Gore is that I tell people is, you know, I've I see, seen him up close a few, you know, a few times, watch him action. And some people thought that he lost the 2000 election because of a few hundred votes in Florida. And I'm saying that's not why he <laughs> lost the election. He lost the election because Al Gore has got the eyes of death. The <laughs> eyes of death. All right, that's what he looks like. When you're up close, he's just like looking straight through you, okay? So that's, that's Al Gore, okay? So anyway, there we go. Al Gore, Al Gore, Al Gore, Al Gore. All right. All right. All right, so the next one we'll do is John, John Kerry. John Kerry. Because I like John Kerry because he's got a really long face. Okay, he's got a really long face. Okay. All right, let's see if I'm going to do this. So he's got a long face. So it kind of starts like this. And kind of goes like this. You know, and you know what? I'm not sure that's really right. Okay, so let's put it right down like this. Okay. Okay. So his nose goes like this, and this is his eyes here, and then his hair goes like this, and his ears are like this. What do you think? John Kerry. What do you think? Not bad. <laughs> John Kerry. All right. There we go. All right. There you go. All right. You've got a lot of cartoons here. Wow. Can we archive these? Can you arrange them? Okay. Um, all right. So let's do. Oh, Bill, Bill, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton. <clears throat> all right. So his face has changed. So this is probably an 80s Bill Clinton. You're going to be thinking, he's got to be a little bit different than he, than he is now. Um, this is going to be a profile. His nose is kind of like that, and he's got the little Elvis mouth like this, you know, little bunny rabbit teeth there like that. And he's got the eyes with the bags underneath it, you know. And I tell folks, you know, this is a problem. He travels a lot, and he's got all these bags, and they charge for every extra bag these days. <laughs> Anyways, okay. So, right, and he's got the used car salesman haircut there. All right. All right. This. And his ears plucked like this, and he's got the chin yeah. like this. All right? There you go. Bill Clinton, what do you guys think? Bill Clinton, all right. There we go. All right. All right. I did not, I did not draw that cartoon. All right. Uh, so uh, let's go to, um, all right, let's go to, I'm going to do H.W. Bush. H.W. Bush. We'll end up with, with Obama. So H.W. Bush, I'm going to do him, make sure I've got one, two, three, oh, we've got three pieces of paper left. All right, so let's do H.W. Bush. Um, he had a funny face. He had a funny face because he looks like an insurance man, right? He doesn't look like anything is specific. But let me, he had a long, long head like this. This is going to be a profile again. Back of head looked like this. 
Okay, kind of a light bulb thing going on the ship. His head, his ear was sticking out the back of his head like this. His nose was sharp and pointy. His eyes went down like this. The lines went up his head way up there. Yeah, went up there. That her mouth was like a bird's beak and little teeth <laughs> rah, 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 like this. <laughs> and he had his chin that went way out like this. All right, way out like this. And then uh, his glasses, which were the vision thing. You remember the vision thing? Oh. So that was it. The vision thing. So yeah, that's George H. W. Bush. George H. W. Bush. Okay. All right, so let's go to George W. Bush. So he was one of my favorites to do George W. Bush. He had him around for eight years. Problem is, you really need to have a horizontal paper to fit his ears, okay? His ears have to go out like this, all right? But let me put his ears in first, just so we make sure we can fit everything in. So let's go across here. <clears throat> all right, so in the middle, we're going to take his nose, which curved like this, very flared nostrils, like this. Um, set of parentheses here like this. His mouth went like this and then up the other side like this. Like this. And chin was like this, which is a W. That kind of helps, okay? Chin was a W. Uh, got lines like this. And now, this is, and now his eyes. He had these little tiny eyes, little tiny eyes, like this, okay? And then a heavy brow that was like this, and then another one that was way up here, like, what the heck's going on here? I don't know. Like this. And, and then the head kind of completed it up, kind of the shape like this. And what do you think, guys? George W. Bush, right? There you go. <laughs> not bad, not bad, not bad. Okay, George W. Bush. All right, we're now down to the last piece of paper. Last piece of paper. And the last caricature of the day. And I will leave that for Barack Obama. All right, so I've been uh, drawing Barack Obama now for, um, you know, five, six years. And I'm just, I, I feel like now I'm only just getting his face. And sometimes it takes that long. And you, and you get to know their face. You know their face better than you know your own face. You look at them more than you look at your own face. And in his case, I like his profile. I've been doing a lot of him recently, actually. So, you know, it's kind of a... You know, the top of his head is round. He's got graying hair, correct, right? Graying hair like this. <laughs> got a pretty heavy brow. With a thin line, his eye in the middle of it coming out like this. Uh, the nose, and nothing particularly special about the nose, except he's got a little mole there. If you've ever seen that, you ever seen the mole? He's got a little mole there. You're never going to take your eyes off of it now. Every time you see it. <laughs> oh, right there. And um, upper lip has got kind of strong upper lip like this. And then the shadow under here. So already you can start to see him appear. So I've been, like I said, I've been watching his profile for a while. And um, you guys are familiar with the birther movement, right? Where these people think that he wasn't born here in the United States. He wasn't born on the island of Hawaii. And I, as I said, because I've been looking at it for such a long time and seeing that strong profile, I'm beginning to think that maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe he wasn't born here on Hawaii. Maybe, maybe he was born on Easter Island. <laughs> that's what I think, like this. So there we go, ladies and gentlemen. That's, um, that's Barack Obama. So I, I want to leave you guys with one last thought. And then I'll be happy to take your questions outside, sign some books. And, and once again, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, so for time, I was president of an international human rights group dedicated to cartoonists, called Cartoonists Right Network International. And uh, it may surprise a lot of people, but in there's large parts of the world, perhaps possibly, likely, a majority of parts of the world, where we couldn't even have this meeting, where the you know, police would march in and you guys would be arrested, and I'd disappear maybe not to be seen again. And the problem, and what we're, the problem is that we're making fun of our head of state. And so there's cartoonists who are currently jailed, tortured, murdered because of what they do. So for me, it's such incredible honor, first, to be able to make a living drawing things that I love to do. Second, the opportunity to be able to live in this time 
in the history of man where one is allowed to do it, and in this country where we take this completely for granted. And finally, with this opportunity to create a book that I can share my 35 years with you here today. So thank you guys very much for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.